So Father, again, we thank you for this morning. We just ask now, Lord, we could continue in a heart of worship, Lord, just prayerful and keeping praise of you ever before us. Lord, we can't ignore the fact that we are in a new calendar year. I sometimes wonder how artificial that is, but Lord, it affects us. We know that we've got a different number in front of us. We've got a number behind us, and things are somehow supposed to be different and change. And Lord, we know so many things stay the same. And Lord, we're in a time now where most of us are wondering what this year will bring. And some of us, I think probably many of us, are not real confident that it's going to be all good. So, Lord, for whatever you have, I just pray that you would prepare us. And, Lord, that we would see that no matter what storms come, that you are an anchor in the midst of those storms. And you alone, Lord, have the power to calm those storms. And maybe more, more importantly, Lord, you are, have the power to calm us within the midst of a storm. So, Lord, for all those things, we seek you and we ask. And now, Lord, we open your word and we just ask that you would guide us through it, Lord. Help us to see, to hear, and Lord, to allow your spirit to move in our midst and do his work. So we give you our attention, and we pray, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see the opening to this psalm, again, very common. We've been seeing it psalm after psalm to the chief musician. And this psalm, interesting, is the psalm of David. That's nothing new either. We've been in David's psalms for a while now. But then it adds two words, which I find interesting, and we don't have a great explanation for it, but he delineates a psalm of David and also says a song. When you look into the Hebrew of the word psalm, it really speaks more of instrumentation, of the playing of music than the singing of music. But when you look into the Hebrew word there that's translated in English as song, it speaks of lyrics, it speaks of the words. I don't know why suddenly we have that, because we've seen previous psalms that have been set to the music of other psalms. But there was a reason David wanted to make sure that we knew this was to be played and sang. Um, That's about all I know about that. It's as clear as I can be on that. Let's look at the first few verses of our psalm. And before we get started, this psalm and the next three as a group of four um, all have a very common theme. And I've said this before as we've gone through psalms. There's been many times where I've sat down to study read through the psalm and the next psalm and the next psalm and thought, you know, I don't really need to say much here. I could just read through these. They all go together and enough would be said. And then I get into studying and go, oh, well, yeah, we need to look at that. Oh, we need to look at that. And suddenly I'm in one of those, as I did this time, four psalms. So the Lord certainly has things to show us. But again, first few verses. Praise is waiting you, O God, in Zion. And to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions you will provide atonement for them. So that opening there, praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. I think one of the first things we need to do is take a look and consider that word praise. I mean, Christians use that word quite often, but in different ways. And you as an individual, may have recently said something like, praise God, in response to some good news, maybe some positive outcome you attributed to God caused you to say, praise God. Some may describe our times of music and singing on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings as praise time. Here at Creekside, we even have a specific time, which we just went through, on Sundays, that we call prayer and praise. You know, I looked at the Cambridge Dictionary definition of praise, and it says this, expressing admiration or approval of the achievements or characteristics of a person or thing. It's a decent definition, but I don't think it goes deep enough when we're considering the praise of God. So I went back, as I've often encouraged you to do, when you're going to do a word study, Remember what we call the principle of first mention. Ask yourself and then go do the research. If I'm going to look up this word, where is the first mention of that word in Scripture? It's a great tool for a Bible student. Go back to the first time it was used and you will learn more about it than you ever might have if you only studied it where you're at. 
Now, sometimes you'll find the definition doesn't change through Scripture. Other times you'll find the first mention, and then you'll find so many other words that are actually defined the same in English. And that's the case here. The first mention of praise in the Bible comes in Genesis chapter 29, kind of late, verse 35. And the Hebrew word there is yodah. And here's the definition. It says literally to use, that is to hold out the hand. Physically to throw a stone or an arrow at or away. Especially to revere or worship with extended hands. So let each of these words speak to you and give you an image, okay? The second time we find it is in Leviticus 19, verse 24, and the Hebrew word is halul. And it means celebration or thanksgiving, or celebration of thanksgiving, and it often had to do with the harvest. And there are those that look at this psalm as having much to do with the harvest, and I won't say it won't, but I think there's deeper things there. And that may be one that, unless you're a farmer or a gardener, that you don't think about much. But yet we have a harvest to reap just being children of God. The next one comes in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 21. And the Hebrew word is tehillah. And it means laudation, to laud someone. And it says specifically a hymn. So we see the invite there for a song to praise. And then the next one is in Judges 5, verse 2, and the Hebrew word is barach, and it means to kneel, as in to kneel down, by implication to bless God. The next one I found was in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 4, and the Hebrew word is halal, and it means to shine. It means to make a show, to boast, and then I love this, and thus be clamorously foolish to rave, to celebrate, to sing. Another one, Psalm 21, verse 13, the Hebrew word is zarmar, and it means to touch the strings or parts of a musical instrument, that is, play upon it, to make music, accompanied by the voice, hence to celebrate in song and music, give praise, sing forth praises. And the last one I came upon was the Hebrew word tadal, which is in Psalm 50, verse 23. And it says, an extension of the hand, confession, that sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. So several Hebrew words, all translated into the English as praise. And I'm not saying that's exhaustive. If you go do the same study, you might find one I missed. But those are the ones I found as I went through the Old Testament. So what did we see in that? We see the praise is physical. It means to hold out. It means to extend the hand. It means to kneel. It means to touch and play an instrument. It means to sing. But we also see the praise is audible because praise is singing. It's giving thanks. It's lauding. It's blessing. It's boasting. It's confessing. We also see the praise is physical. It reveres. It blesses. Oh, excuse me, I skipped my own list. It's audible, and my point was supposed to be that it's physical, it's audible, and it's also expressive. Because we're told in that list to revere, to bless, and again, to be clamorously foolish. I want you to hold on to that one. To sing, to make a show, which means to be expressive, raise hands, kneel, worship, So praise is physical, audible, expressive, and I would add to that it's intimate because we're told here it's a personal sacrifice. It's a personal sacrifice. And if you come to praise God in any of those ways and you don't feel like you're giving something of yourself, then it's probably less than what God defines as praise. That it would be a sacrifice, that you would put more into it than probably anything else, that you would give something of yourself that means something to yourself. You know, it's very interesting, we sang that song this morning about making worship what it's supposed to be and apologizing to God for what we've made it, that we would bring him something of value, perfect, 
And I've said this before, and I'll just remind you that when, whether it's Janie or Mahela or anyone else that comes to do worship, we don't sit down before and say, okay, you know, do this song because it fits what I'm going to talk about. No. God gives a set every time. The Spirit gives a set every time that's just perfect. You know, and I was telling Janie beforehand, and I didn't recognize it until we were practicing this morning. I was like, man, in a very light form, the worship set that God gave her is the outline of this message. But I want to just focus for one moment on being clamorously foolish. You know, I haven't told this story in a while, but I've told it many times. My own experience of being a baby Christian. Now, I know some of what I'm about to describe still remains as part of who I am. But when I came to know the Lord, the man I was prior to that moment was a man that could hold off a crowd with a stare. I was a man that could walk into a room and stand against the wall and everybody would think I was eight foot tall because I could just hold people off. And I did it on purpose. And I didn't realize that I said to my wife one time when we were leaving a gathering, I said, people don't talk to me. People don't come near me. And she says, it's the way you hold yourself. I'm like, what? I'm this little guy. I mean, she goes, it's the way you hold yourself. And I was just very good about putting a bubble around me. Serious, which I know I still am. Military bearing, which I was born with and got magnified through 22 years of service. But when the Lord got a hold of me, man, was I a different man. You know, and I think we all go through the experience of being a baby Christian. And we look back on that and sometimes we lament the fact that we're not all that that we were then. Because then we mature. And I don't think that's what God means about maturing into Christianity. I think we're supposed to keep this clamorous foolishness. But, you know, my boys were involved in soccer, and I coached for a while, but most of the time I was a parent on the sideline. And suddenly, there I was, a man who still wears dark, plain colors, but there I was on the sidelines of those games and other places I went, wearing bright colored Jesus shirts. And I was a fool. I was a fool for Jesus. I smiled. That was rare. Sometimes people would say it's still rare, but it's just how I am. But what I'm trying to say is I didn't even know I was praising God by being clamorously foolish. You know, we don't want to be out of order. We don't do, we want to do things that would embarrass our faith in a sense. But man, to be a fool for God, what a beautiful thing. Not a clown, but to be foolish for God, to be willing to let down those barriers. It's a beautiful thing, and it is a form of praise. And it is a form of personal sacrifice. Now, back to our verse, verse, praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. Now, the psalmist, <clears throat> the psalmist says that praise, that that praise, all that we've now discovered it to be, is waiting for God in Zion. So we're given the sense that when God came to meet his people in Jerusalem, he would receive, be received, in an atmosphere of praise. But it says praise is a waiting. There's another word we make sure that need to make sure that we understand. The Hebrew word translated awaiting, or waiteth, if you're into King James, means stillness, it means quiet, and it means silence. The Amplified Version of the Bible reads this. It says, To you, O God, belongs silence, the submissive wonder of reverence. The New American Standard says, There will be silence before thee. Mr. Spurgeon said this, he said, certainly, when the soul is most filled with adoring awe, she is least content with her own expressions and feels most deeply how inadequate are all mortal songs to proclaim the divine goodness. Interesting perspective. 
So what we're being told here, this silence is part of worship and praise. David said in Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2, he said, truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He, is, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So some may say, is there a contradiction here? I mean, how can a person praise God physically, audibly, expressively, and yet praise him silently? If your soul silently waits for God, when will all these other forms of praise come forth? Well, the answer to that is simple. The other forms of praise come when you experience God's presence. But here's the problem. Neither waiting nor being silent comes easy for most people. So I'm going to share an invaluable truth with you. You might want to write this down. In the waiting, the strength to wait is given. I'll say that again. In the waiting, the strength to wait is given. You know, silence is a killer. Most people can't handle it. Most people will jump to fill the silence because it makes them uncomfortable. You know, sometimes we pause during or at the end of our worship and we just wait. And it's interesting, maybe I'm just oversensitive. I don't think it's my imagination, but there's a tension that happens. Some people enjoy that time. Many others do not. You know, I spent some time in the military, into a special program, became an addictions counselor, very secular side of things. I tried to bring God into it as much as I could, but we use secular, you know, worldly um, counseling techniques. One of the things we had to do was we rang group, group therapy. Counselor facilitates group therapy, and I have to admit, in that setting, silence is an amazing tool. And why it's an amazing tool is because people will become uncomfortable and they'll speak when they might not have otherwise. But I have sat in those groups for, I mean, minutes, long minutes, and just watched people struggle, squirm, begin to sweat because nobody was speaking. Well, that's not the setting I'm talking about. I'm talking about you as a believer sitting in the presence and with God just waiting, just waiting for him to show up in all his power and all his glory, tangible presence, speaking to you possibly either because you're reading the word or you're one of those privileged to have that sensitivity to his voice. But I'll repeat it again. In the waiting, the strength to wait is given. Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 31 He told us that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Look at the gift there. Look at what was given to the person who would wait. Their strength would be renewed. They would mount up with wings like eagles. They would run and not be weary. They would walk and not faint. The gift of waiting. In Psalm 40, David says he waited patiently for the Lord. And what happened? The Lord set his feet upon a rock, established his steps, and put a new song in his mouth. Isaiah again, chapter 64, verse 4, speaking to God, he says this, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. Let's again read the opening verses of the psalm. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion, and to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. So we read that these people awaiting quietly for God will praise him in Zion. Zion speaks of Jerusalem, therefore we understand the opening of this psalm addresses Israel. 
And we see that God's people would gather in Jerusalem to thank God for answering their prayers and to give sacrifices in praise in fulfillment of the vows that they made. Now you may say vows. What are vows? It's simply promises made to God. And as we go into this section this morning, I want you to think, maybe think more later than right now because I want you to listen. But I want you to think about how often you make a vow to God. You know, we may not do it in some great dramatic, you know, I vow, you know, you just, we make promises to God. Sometimes we feel like we're making them to ourselves, but we're doing it before the throne, and we're actually making it to him. Now, the Bible stresses the importance of keeping a vow that's made. I'm going to read again from Mr. Spurgeon, because he captures the pressure that's on a person, I believe, who makes a vow. And he said this, he said, a vow unkept will burn the conscience like a hot iron. Vows of service, of donation, of praise, or whatever they may be, are no trifles. And in the day of grateful praise, they should without fail be fulfilled to the utmost of our power. So vows are something pretty serious. Serious to fulfill, and possibly more serious, unfulfilled. There's about 30 biblical references to vows, most of which are in the Old Testament. The book of Leviticus and Numbers have several references to vows in relation to the offerings and sacrifices. And there were disastrous consequences for the Israelites who broke those vows, especially vows to God. You know, there's a story in the book of Judges about a man named Jephthah. And it illustrates the foolishness of making vows without understanding the consequences. So no one's saying don't make a vow. Understand the consequences, which should be a habit for all of us, for all of our behaviors and choices. Now, Jephthah, he led the Israelites, and I'm going to leave out a lot of that story. Judges chapter 11, you can read it yourself. But before he led the Israelites into battle against the Ammonites, Jephthah described there as a mighty man of valor, made a reckless vow that he would give to the Lord whatever first came out of the doors to meet him if he returned home as a victor. So after the Lord granted him victory, it was his daughter that was the first to come out of the door to meet him. Now some time passed and some things took place. I'm not going to go through that, but Jephthah remembered his vow and he sacrificed her to the Lord. And I think that's probably the most graphic demonstration of the foolishness of a rash vow. And so we need to consider, what are the consequences of what I'm about to promise? Can I fulfill it, and what if I don't? And I think it just keeps us very sober-minded before the Lord as we converse with him. Now, Jesus taught concerning vows. He did so in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 33. And he says this, he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now, we need some background. The religious leaders of Jesus' time, of that day, they advocated keeping a vow if it was a public vow using God's name. However, they would say, if the vow was made during everyday conversation, referencing only heaven or earth or Jerusalem, it was not really binding the people were given a loophole. They could lie or exaggerate in their conversations and lend themselves an air of credibility by swearing, saying, I swear by heaven that this is true. They could not be held to account because they did not specifically swear by God's name and the vow was private. These are things, the warning here, these are things we don't play with. 
We don't play with vows. We don't try to make a vow, but make it so that it's not binding. Because what Jesus goes on to say is that your yes be yes and your no, no. Because I think what he would say to us today, your word should be good. Your word should be good. We don't play games with God. We shouldn't. If we're going to promise him something, it's because we intend to fulfill it. And we can understand that if we don't, as with everything, there's a consequence. Look at verse 2 of our psalm again. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. So the praise of the people awaits, and vows are performed because God hears and answers prayers. So they were fulfilling their vows. And then we see how God's goodness not only draws Israel, but also draws all flesh. We started off with a focus on God's chosen Israel, and now he opens it to all, speaking to the Gentile nations. And I love that verse because it speaks of our God, who is the God who hears. He listens. Shema in the Hebrew. He listens. How comforting. Look at verse 3 again. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions. You will provide atonement for them. You know, with that verse, we see David was honest concerning his personal struggle with sin. He confessed how he sometimes failed with that struggle. He also understood that God's answer for transgressions is an atoning sacrifice that God provides. And the truth is, and I think most of us would agree, I would hope all of us would agree, if not for God's grace, sin would prevail. And although saved by grace, believers still struggle with sin. We can't overlook that. And because of that, like David, a believer must be ready and willing to confess their sins and return to the atoning power of the cross to be freed from sin's bondage. Let's pick up in verse 4. Blessed is the man you choose and calls to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. So the priests who served in God's house, his holy temple, were chosen by God. And beyond them, God wanted all his chosen people, all that would believe on him to serve and live as priests. And this is why the courts of the temple are mentioned. Because in the courts of the temple, all were welcomed. All were welcome. All people were welcomed. But once saved, all people are welcome into the sanctuary of the Lord. Inside, all the way to the altar. I mean, after all, we're told believers are a kingdom of priests. And I think every time this comes up in Scripture, there's a, a little bit of resistance to accept that as it is said. Because that word means so many things. But a kingdom of priests. I would doubt for many of you that you wake up in the morning with that image of yourself. But you know, in the Old Testament, it was spoken of very clearly. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. You say, okay, that was for God's chosen, the Israelis in the Old Testament times. We're, we're, We're in 2024, hard to say that number. But then listen to the New Testament speak about the same to every one of you who count yourself a blood-bought believer this morning. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, but you, you believer, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There's a lot to feel good about as a believer. 
there's a lot to speak to yourself about, about your position in Christ and in his kingdom. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, listen, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So how do you, how do you let that settle and be okay with you? How, how do you accept the fact that somehow, somehow you're a king and a priest? Now, as I said, that word priest has got us all messed up. You know, the, can hand that off to the, to the Catholic Church and all the Catholic Church lights that have come from it. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about those who serve in the sanctuary of God to God, which is really what we are. We are those that serve God in his sanctuary because we've been invited in there as believers. How can we, another, another way we can justify or rationalize that we're priests? Because you, as a believer, have the ability to share the gospel with someone. You minister to them. You minister to their soul. You're concerned about them and their life and the life thereafter. That makes you a priest. You are ministering. You have the power to minister. You're all called, as believers, as servants. Same word as minister. You know, I was teasing Clyde, who we spoke on the phone previously, and I knew the story that he told this morning. And it was funny because the man invited him in the room, not really to be personal at first, but just to close the door. And I thought, how much like God is that? That he would use a bathroom door to call his saint into the presence of someone who needed to hear. And the man asked him, are you a minister? And I understand, and I'm not taking Clyde to task for it. We said, oh, no, no, no. And, uh, and I said, yeah, not, not a professional. And then I told him, I said, probably better suited, not a professional. Just a servant of God who has the gospel on his tongue, and he wants to share it. And he did minister to that person, and he ministered to an entire family. And for that day, Clyde, you were a priest. It didn't, you didn't walk out of there and lose that title, though. And so I... I Stress this because I want you to see the privilege you have, the power that's given to you, and that if you think your Christianity is shallow, it's because your Christianity is shallow. Your understanding is shallow. And I'm not saying that as, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not trying to offend you. But I'm offering you something to step into if you've never had. And let what God says about you be yes and amen. Look at verse four again. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. So once a person belongs to God, they enjoy a relationship that is inexplicable. We have many ways we'd like to describe it, but ultimately it's inexplicable. And that relationship is with the goodness of God. His residence in the believer and the believer's residence in him, if that relationship is properly understood and nourished, listen, if that relationship is properly understood and nourished, it can only elicit one response. Praise. Praise. Everything I just got done saying from priest and king, and now you may say, okay, priest, you got me there. I have to think about that. King? King? Someday, as a believer in the millennial kingdom on this earth, with Jesus ruling and reigning with a rod of iron from Jerusalem in the seat of David, you and I, as the immortals, will rule and reign with him. So it's a future to be fulfilled, but yet no less true. So when you consider that, and then you consider this relationship we have with his goodness, 
I dare say, if not a response of praise, I don't know what else. And we've learned a lot about praise this morning. But you need to let the Lord's presence guide you in how you praise. You know, there are those here that express themselves very freely. And I'm not trying to compare you to others, but I know there's those here that are very tight during worship. The thought of raising hands would be like, ooh, no, not here. Maybe one. There's a Christian comedian, I can't think of his name, but he does a whole skit on the different, you know, ways of that Christians finally get to surrendering. But I've encouraged you before, and I'll encourage you again. You know, if God tells you to raise your hands, then just give in to it. You will find a place, if you've never done it, that you've never been. And here's the one that would challenge you, but if God tells you to kneel, then kneel. He may come here one morning and tell us all to get on our faces. What a glorious thing that would be. Because someday standing before him, I bet that's where you'll end up. If you've never just let yourself be comfortable in worship and praise, I just invite you to that. Look at verse 5. By awesome deeds and righteousness you will answer us, so God of our salvation, you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far off seas, who established the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, You who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the furthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and the evening rejoice. So David again looks beyond Israel to the ends of the earth, to the far off seas. And that's not actually a good translation. From the Hebrew, what I would gather, it's the lands upon the far off seas. And there indeed was a special way that Israel belonged to God, but he was and is the God of the whole earth. And David reminds us that God is powerful enough to quiet the seas as well as the inhabitants of the lands. You know, when Yvonne and I go to the coast, we enjoy being away, but one of the things we enjoy the most is being near the ocean. And I think most that like the coast understand that feeling. Just near that awesome power. I mean, I just, I just meditate upon it as I watch it. You know, and I love, I love when it's calm because it's special, but then when it's rough, you know, there's something different about that, a different kind of special. You know, we try to get a place as close to its edge as possible, and we always leave a door open, a sliding glass door, whatever it is, from a hotel room so that we can listen to that all night, sleep to that all night. And those of you that have been fortunate enough to see a really stormy sea knew how, know how loud it can be. Well, it's stormy because God allowed it to be stormy. So he is the great power that can also silence it. But it just shows the reach that he has that there's no location on earth that resides outside his reach. There's no noise too great that he can't hush its roar. And therefore, what we see and hear, listen to me, what we see and hear, God allows. Because he doesn't have to allow it. So when we look across the landscape of our country right now, and we see so many things, and we hear so many things, that roar now to a deafening level, understand that he could quiet that. And he's not. But that doesn't make him less powerful or less in control. It just means he's totally in control. We don't yet understand a lot of what's going on. And so keep that in mind. Picture him on the throne where he is and the power that he wields. His charge we read over these things and even over the coming and the going of both the morning and evening. So here we are again. This too should elicit a response to which I would say, have you been paying attention? Do I need to tell you again what that response should be? Or can you tell me? 
Praise. One person was listening. Praise. How could you not praise when you read of God's awesomeness? When you read of his power? When you understand him to be sovereign? When you understand him that his providence is work in the world and in your life and in mind? Unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, it, these things, because the things of the world blind us to these things, that sometimes our words are more like curses than praises. Because we can't make sense of so much of what we see. And the things that we do make sense of are just so evil and wrong that sometimes in our complaining, guilty, I can find myself cursing. You think, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm cursing what I see. I know, but God's allowing that. We're stopping that. He's in charge of that. And I am certainly lecturing myself here because I have that habit and I need to find time to praise in the midst instead of curse. You know, that one word I read in the Hebrew earlier, barach, it means to bless, but it's also used in scripture to curse. Know somebody by that name? Barak. Look at verse 9. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, and so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. So from the temple of Jerusalem to lands and seas afar off, to a perspective that accounts for all of God's creation, I would say this psalm has carried us a great distance. What is provided for his creation is God's to give, and he does. What things he created, he cares for, and he maintains. God's goodness shines when we see that his provision comes in abundance. You see how many times that word was used in those verses. And he gives not only regularly, but he gives consistently. You know, it's, a hum it's humbling to realize that he called us to be stewards of all that he gave and all that he gives. I say that would be a call to sit quietly. To sit quietly in that humility. To sit there a while. As we were encouraged to do from the beginning of this psalm. To sit quietly. And if nothing else takes you to that practice, let it be the humility that we receive when we consider who God is and who we're not. We sit in that for a while. And we ponder all of this in our hearts. But then I have to ask you, where do you suppose that the quieting pondering should lead us? And what response should it elicit? Now say it like you mean it. Praise. You didn't say it like you meant it. Try it again. Praise. That's where it should lead us. Truth be told, again, I'm not, a, I'm not qualified any more than anybody else. But to read God's word in any length or form and not find praise in our hearts seems, well, it just seems like we missed something. I mean, there shouldn't be a single verse of our Bible that doesn't elicit praise. No chapter, no verse, no book. No moment spent with him. No time that we're praying. And so I think it's something as we, I'll use the artificial construct, go into this new year, that maybe that should be our contemplation. 
I don't believe in New Year's resolutions, but if you need to make one, maybe it's to praise God more. Because the truth is, when we're praising God, it's really hard to be disheartened. It's harder to be negative. Because something took us to that point of praise that was completely positive. And so I'm not trying to be Pollyannish, because I think you know I know the seriousness of the hour. But nothing's going to carry us through that seriousness better than the praise of our God. Amen? So worship and ushers can come up. And not that I needed one, but what a great segue into our time of communion. Because that's really what our communion celebration is. It's a praise. It's a praise of our Lord for what he did on our behalf. That he was faithful all the way to the cross and a vicious death. He was faithful to raise on the third day as he promised. And everything since that day has just been his faith, faithfulness on display. And so let's just come to that table and take the bread and take the cup and do exactly as we've studied this morning. Let the humility of his better actions settle into your heart. Maybe, maybe as I encouraged you the last time we were together, just take a little bit longer. Go a little bit slower into your communion time so that you can sit quietly, you can feel his presence, and then you can praise him for what he's done. So, Father, we thank you, and without saying, but I'll say it, Lord, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, because your presence is mighty. And, Lord, remind us, Lord, let your spirit remind us of how often we need to sit quietly awaiting, knowing that when we feel your presence, it'll be our praise that you are waiting for, that you came for. You created us to worship and praise you. And so, Lord, I pray that that would become a heart or at least a strengthened heart in all of us. And, Lord, we are, I speak for myself and I know many others, burdened, you know, not at peace with so many of the things that we see, so many things we're anticipating, so much of what we don't know. And yet, Lord, your word is just full of the assurance of your peace of your presence, of your power, of your sovereignty, of your providence. And Lord, there's where our minds need to be, on your goodness and our relationship with that goodness. And from that, let it pour forth from our hearts, worship and praise. So we thank you, Lord, and uh, we just honor you this morning. We honor your name. We do so in your name, Jesus. Amen.